course, since a lot of questions uh, pile up again, uh, I'm trying to answer some more today. And yeah, hope you will be interested in that. What is the typical guitar tuning for Avantasia? Or do you tune differently for each song? Oh, that's an interesting question. Uh, we typically tune everything basically in D natural. So like, uh, like the regular guitar, every string tuned down, tuned down uh, two half steps. Uh, but Oliver uses sometimes drop C tuning in that uh, for life. But then uh, we just decided that he only does that as on I think it's on two songs on Twisted Mind and the other one uh, doesn't come to my mind at the moment uh, where we use that uh, I, I did use it on the album here and there a C a drop C tuning but I hate I hate retuning and uh, I just try to play the uh, higher voice in this uh, in these songs so basically I don't detune the guitar or retune the guitar and I don't change the guitar in the whole show. I mean we play something like three hours and I'm just there with the same guitar with the same tuning all the time and that is quite uh, comfortable. Why is the Aina album not on Spotify? Also could you tell us the inspiration for this album? Is there the possibility for a second album? I actually never checked if Aina is on uh, Spotify. I will do this now. I don't know why it is not on Spotify actually, uh, so I can check this <laughs> and I'll try to contact the rec uh, record company or the former record company and see if they are able to do this. Um, there is not nothing planned for a second one at the moment and it doesn't seem like it's going to be in the future, well you never know, but I I'm happy you like it. <laughs> How do established bands and producers look for new singers for projects such as Masters of Ceremonies or as backing singers for Avantasia? Oh, that is a complicated question because you cannot really answer that specifically. Uh, uh, I start with, for example, backing singers on Avantasia, which is completely depending on what's happening at the moment. It's just happening, basically. Uh, when, when Amanda didn't come on tour anymore we decided to get another woman of course to sing and uh, i was already working with adrian and uh, i was talking to uh, toby about her that i really love the way she sings and uh, she's a nice person and everything and then we just decided to like uh ah, to, to ask her if, if she could do it so it's just because we we're just actually talking about her I was working with her at the moment and uh, found that a very easy solution and I, I knew what we can expect so that is uh, why I chose that and I chose her for my project like a masters of ceremony because I worked with her band on the on her first album also on the ones that came later actually but uh, so we worked on this uh, first album of Seven Spires and so I, I was in contact with her and she was also here and I met her one time in New York and yeah so uh, then I, somehow I asked her if she would be I'd like to be the singer of Masters of Ceremony and she wanted so that was it so it's just usually coincidences stuff is happening I would never really uh, did like Facebook thing that we're, like we're singer wanted or something nothing like it. It's just happening people you know Ina for example is a very old friend of um, uh, Ina Morgan who also sings in Avantasia is a very old friend of uh, Olli Hartmann and I also knew her singing because she was already singing in the backing choir of Avantasia a couple of years ago for Scarecrow I think it was uh, so I mean it's just you know people and usually you work with people that you know already and hardly with people that uh, that you, yeah that apply for the job in a way because it's just uh, yeah usually a little bit complicated because you would have to check out uh, to work with them and if you already work with somebody and you have an idea then you, you usually chose choose this but I have to admit I was already checking the YouTube sometimes especially also for masters of ceremony when I was still searching for a singer 
especially I was actually searching for a male singer in the beginning and uh, just didn't find anybody that was 100% uh, what I what I wanted for this so uh, and then I thought like oh maybe a girl and then it was obvious <laughs> so uh, it could happen that you also search for that on, on YouTube because it's a very good platform for stuff like this but yeah so far basically everything happened like this sometimes just people just write me and uh, offer their services and sometimes if it's just in the moment that it happens that I say okay let's try it just do me uh, whatsoever cello or <laughs> whatever the offer was so it really is there's no master plan it's just happening somehow <laughs> So I cannot really give you a tip. I'm very sorry for how to approach that thing. Of course, uh, getting yourself out there on YouTube with some stuff that people can see and then you that you can link to uh, uh, emails that you maybe write to some people um, is not a bad idea. Do you have any tips for recording power metal demos at home? There's a lot of different ways to approach this. I mean, first of all, uh, a very basic thing is how do you do the drums? And basically everybody nowadays, uh, especially in the demo phase, is using um, programming because it's it's the hardest thing to record. You need a, like a proper set of microphones. You need a proper set, a proper drum set, proper drummer, and a proper room and everything else. Uh, Preamplifiers. I mean, you just need everything else so much more than you need for a vocal recording or for a guitar recording. So usually people use programmings or like play their stuff with an uh, with an e-drum and use uh, programs like superior drama or oh that's just quite some steven slate for example quite some stuff out there um that you can use and it's a lot of good stuff too and so i would say this is probably the way to go for especially for power metal i mean if you do jazz maybe not the right thing but uh, for power metal it's a good thing and easy and uh, so you probably would go for this uh, for a demo and then guitar wise also i mean in these days you're probably gonna use like a not a real amplifier anymore but if you i mean there's a lot of stuff like camper and stuff like this all these simulations a lot of plugins all a lot of good stuff i mean it's ridiculous how much good stuff is around but uh, just recently uh, what was coming up was like to go back to real amplifiers again with uh, something like a two notes captor or other devices that uh, reduce uh, that you can use the amplifier without a uh, speaker cabinet and then uh, do um, a simulation of the, uh, of the speaker only which is a very good option really sounds great I, I use that now a lot of times um, it's really a cool thing to do so you can also use just with uh, use it with a preamplifier if you have something like this just an old uh, 19 inch or whatsoever and it's a real cool feel to play through this and there's great software I like uh, especially this software from from two notes I really love that it's called wall of sound uh, where you can like combine speakers and stuff and it's really really cool it's very very hard to do this with real speakers actually you need a good studio good cabinets microphones everything and yeah there's there's a lot it's so much easier than back in the day to do demos now so guitar is no problem uh bass also uh, maybe you want to check out wall of sound uh, in the corona times it was uh, i don't know exactly the date when it, when it's ending but it was free for a while so maybe you'd want to check it out or download it uh, I'm not sponsored by this <laughs> and um, um, yeah bass also very easy I mean you can do the do it the same way use a camper or same way basically the same as the guitar usually I would go for a virtual thing like a camper or plug-in sense amp something like it it's really really easy um, to do that keyboards speak for themselves it's very it's anyways in the computer usually nowadays, especially for power metal. So you would use the libraries that are around and do it. You use them to your liking. Uh, record vocals, 
yeah, you can do vocals pretty easily nowadays. A lot of people, uh, especially in metal and screaming voices, used uh, Shure SM7B uh, for it, which is a very, uh, yeah, not cheap, but uh, that was would be the wrong word. Uh, a very affordable microphone in a very good quality that does a, th a certain thing that you even have a hard time to f uh, get the same result with a like very expensive condenser microphone because this is a dynamic microphone and um, the good thing about it is uh, you don't capture so much of the room you're recording in because usually the people don't have a good room they have like reflections and stuff and you don't want this on the recording it really makes the recording sound cheap so you uh, you have less, less of this and still a good sound and it's a, it's a good combination of of parameters that are good for a like a, a like a home solution for recording I would, so to say and mixing wise i mean there's so many platforms that you can use uh, nowadays a lot of people go for logic or cubase or whatsoever i mean uh, UAD just came out with Luna, <coughs> uh, which is uh, which basically comes with the system. Uh, I use Pro Tools since basically forever. I mean, I was also using Logic for a while, like for doing keyboards and stuff, and run had, had it running in the same system and system in sync. But now, since uh, the MIDI stuff got better on Pro Tools as well, I'm using it for everything, and I'm quite happy with it it's i mean no, no pro program is perfect you always find better stuff in the other programs but for me it's great because i just know it since so many years and i just i'm just used to it i don't want to change it and uh, but you can do good results you have good results even with garage band that comes with with an apple computer for free uh, so really really not the problem anymore uh, to have the gear because basically everybody can afford this. Everybody that can afford to be a musician or to make music in general. Of course, if you cannot afford a computer, you need a computer. Yeah, but uh, everything else is really affordable nowadays. So much, much, much easier than it used to be back in the days. And so, yeah, it's a wide field and a lot of possibilities. And uh, I mean, if you have like uh, really questions like for something very specific that you can just write me again and I will try to answer that but uh, very hard to give it like a general overview because it's such a big field actually. Which memories do you have on your work on the Running Wild album Black Hand Inn? Black Hand Inn, wow, that is a long time ago. That must have been uh, maybe 1993, something like it, I really don't remember. I remember quite some things about this production. Um, we had a good time. Uh, it was happening in, um, horror, in the Horror Sound Studio. In, um, I mean, not, not only. The drums were happening in the Vox Studio, which is not uh, actually available anymore. First time I've been there was, was for Black Hand Inn. And uh, Jörg Michael was playing the drums. So, for, yeah, yeah, that was... That was the first time I met him, actually. Still working with him. He's um, working in the agency that does our concerts and stuff. Oh, he owned this one of the owners. And uh, yeah, first time I met him there at Vox Studio. And we did the drum recordings in this wonderful studio, which is really a great studio. And this first, the first time uh, I even made a the first time I made drum samples also of the drum recordings that we did and I still have have them in my collection it was yeah, that was a good time really I have, have good memories in that and we, we experimented a lot with stuff and yeah I also did uh, then we went over to the Horizon studio did the rest of the recordings uh, guitar bass uh, and keyboards I was actually doing keyboards on this album as far as I remember <laughs> I mean, I did keyboards on it, but I don't know anymore if I exclusively did it, but I think yes. And I was taking over a part of the recordings, recording sessions. And I mean, I was working together basically, uh, together with uh, 
Charlie Bauerfein, so he was uh, the main guy. I was uh, basically his assistant. Uh, uh, we, we did a lot of stuff together, also especially artistically. We had a, we were a lot of times so we were in contact. So, and I was he was a little bit more for the technic on the technical side on the, in, in these days. So he was he was actually doing the mixes, and I was just. Uh, Basically doing recordings, edits, uh, keyboards, and some productions I played also guitar and bass and this and that. So I was uh, I was doing everything that was uh, that was that had to be done. <laughs> a recording at night while he was recording it in the daytime, or the other way around. Uh, and uh, so he was mixing this. Uh, I mean, I was also there, but and we we were like talking about stuff, and and uh, I was. Doing, like I said, like uh, edits, uh, also sound edits on the computer because we just started using that uh, that stuff from Digi Design back in the day. Yeah, so that's what I remember. And, uh, yeah, some quite some good times with Rolf. And uh, yeah, it was a good time. <laughs> Is it easy to work with Tobias Summit? Yes, first of all, I have to say it's very cool to work with Toby. Uh, and it's generally good to work with friends and he's a very good friend of mine and we basically talk every day on the phone and uh, I think it's not a problem or a disadvantage uh, also for example with Miro who's, he's I know him since the first grade of school uh, we had the studio together we did bands together he's now playing in Avantasia as well never had problems and with Toby it's the same uh, I know him since the beginning of the two, 2000s I would say it's the first time we worked together and uh, yeah there was like a certain chemistry from the beginning on and uh, the whole thing the relation uh, musically and friendship wise but especially of course music wise is where it's more important or it's more like a factor it's based on respect and uh, we, we know what we are able to do or not and uh, so it's very honest and very uh, straightforward and it's very cool to work with him he's a super talented uh, gifted musician and uh, easy i mean especially over the years we developed a way of working and of understanding that it's totally easy to uh, to do stuff together like he would always listen when i do something for him for example he would always listen and even if he would have had an, an, another idea in his head before uh, he would say you know what I, 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 I wait until it grows on me and if it doesn't then we can change it and usually he, he tries to understand what I was thinking and so we st stuff comes together in a good way so uh, I think it's much better to be friends than to hate each other when you work together I think that that's, that that's that's not a better platform uh, or a better way of working together so i think it's really cool that it's like the way it is and uh, yeah hope it stays like this for for a long time can you do a rig rundown for avantasia i did it once actually it's a while ago on tour with a guitar magazine i don't know what rig i was using at that time because i was using a lot of different things all over my career well, i mean anyway all over my career but just with Avantasia already uh, it changed it changed basically or almost every tour uh, to a complete different thing the first tours I was doing with amplifiers I think uh, I used uh, just Marshall vintage moderns and uh, basically one Marshall vintage modern and two, two cabinets and one spare and very straightforward just a delay on the lead channel and a var pedal and that's it and uh, didn't use more so basically uh, yeah that's it and uh, on the second tour i added one more amplifier for the solo channel and stuff like this and then i was using uh, camper and then i was using helix and all this all of that stuff was great i mean it's just practical 
to bring not so much stuff on tour when you fly. Nowadays I'm using, um, especially in Europe, I try to use real amplifiers again uh, with a speaker simulation only and uh, uh, something like the two notes captor to get uh, that you don't have to use real amplifiers and uh, which is a great solution and it's a lot of fun actually and uh, but for for my fly rig I think I will continue with the helix uh, for, uh, for the moment because it really worked fine it's super small and delivered something cool and uh, also I have another fly rig actually that I still have to see where I was using one of my old radial uh, tone bones into this uh, two notes thing. Uh, also a good solution. There's, there's a, lo a lot of different things. So a rig rundown is maybe complicated. If I do a rig rundown, I should maybe do one at home. And, uh, and then I can show like the possibilities you have on that I'm using in general also for the recordings because I'm using a lot of different things. So a Rick, a Rick rundown in the classical, classic sense maybe doesn't make sense with me. How do you decide in which key to write in if you have so many good singers to write for? Depends a little bit. Uh, when it's re when we really talk about metal because I'm not only doing metal, you take in consideration not only the key of the singer but also the key of the song in general so you don't want to have if you have generally have a detuning for like a d natural tuning or something which a lot of people use including avantasia or also my band like masters of ceremony i'm using detuning uh like d g c etc um then you try not to make a song for example on on b because that would be very high or uh, on A, right? The, uh, that would be rather too low or too high. So, and then it doesn't really sound so good on guitar because the, guitar, it's, the music is very guitar based. And then you try to make melodies that fit, that, that work in that range. Uh, that, that can be a, a thing, you know, uh, that takes, uh, that, that, that's a part of the decision what uh, tuning you're working in. Uh, but if you're really not working riff based or it's not so important at all, then I would really go for the chords, uh, like for the melody, just to, to, to see the melody and then see the singer who's singing the melody and then uh, change the tune into the best tonality for the singer that he sounds best in and then try to make the music around it. If the music doesn't sound good, then, then you, sometimes we also or I make stuff, I do stuff like, uh, you know, the chorus sounds so great, and but the riff doesn't sound good. Uh, you go and experiment a little bit, and then you you might transpose stuff, just the chorus, and put it into another key and stuff like this. This can also happen. So it's always a decision based on many factors, and sometimes it's naturally coming. So without a lot of thinking. I mean, I mean, I do this so many, for so many years, but of course, I usually know uh, and also check where the singers are good at and what notes they can reach or not, and try to take this into consideration as well for the key that I'm working in. Gibt es im Plan Masters of Ceremony and Adrian nochmal live zu sehen? Die Frage war auf Deutsch. Das beantworte ich dann auch mal auf Deutsch. Uh, ja, den Plan gibt es schon lange. Es war bloß, äh, die Möglichkeit hatte sich halt nicht geboten. Und jetzt äh, in Zeiten von Corona ist es auch nicht gerade besser geworden. Also wir hätten jetzt äh, Möglichkeiten gehabt im Sommer, was zu machen. Äh, wird natürlich jetzt nicht klappen. Und äh, die Planung jetzt sieht auch nicht so rosig aus momentan, weil man einfach gar nichts planen kann. Äh, wir stehen ja ganz am Anfang und da ist es super schwierig, eine Tour zu planen. Und es ist auch schon ziemlich viel alles belegt. Ich weiß gar nicht, wie man ja momentan rangehen soll. Wir würden gerne als Support irgendwo drauf springen <lacht> auf eine Tour und äh, müssen mal schauen, was für Möglichkeiten sich ergeben. Geplant ist auf jeden Fall, das zu machen. Wir würden es sehr gerne machen, aber es ist halt sehr schwierig, momentan das zu verwirklichen. Aber wir hoffen, dass es klappt.
To what extent is your dog Olaf helpful with productions? <laughs> Olaf, uh, Olaf gives me the calm. <laughs> uh, I mean, obviously he's not really participating on the productions, but he does uh, give give a balance in uh, in life that is kind of good for you because you're not it. He drags you out of the studio because you, you gotta take a walk with him uh, every day. And so I usually do the tour in the morning. So it forces me to go outside and uh, have a little time to think and have some fresh air. And this is really important for productions. It's really, it's a factor you, you should not underestimate. Uh, one factor of doing good stuff is also doing pauses and get your mind uh, free a little bit. Uh, if you get stuck into uh, in the room all the time and you're just like, forcing yourself to work on stuff without pauses, it's not good for the product, it's not good for yourself. And uh, so in this regard, the doc really helps me actually. Thanks a lot for your interesting questions again. And if you have further questions, please don't hesitate to ask. I'll keep on asking and I will try to do my best to answer them as well.